For the record, my name is Tanya Fernandez Anderson, the District 7 City Councilor. I am the chair of the Boston City Council Committee on Ways and Means. This hearing is being recorded as being live streamed at boston.gov forward slash city dash council dash TV and broadcast on Xfinity Channel 8, RCN Channel 82, and Fios Channel 964. The Council's budget review process is, will encompass a series of public hearings beginning in April and running through June. We strongly encourage residents to take a moment to engage in this process by giving public testimony um, for the record. You can do this in several ways. Attend one of the hearings and give testimony. We will take public testimony at each departmental hearing and also at two hearings dedicated to public testimony. The full schedule is on our website at boston.gov forward slash council dash budget. Our scheduled hearings dedicated to public testimony were, was on April 26 at 6 p.m. and the following will be on June 2nd at 6 p.m. You can give testimony in person here in the chamber or virtually via Zoom. For in-person testimony, please come to the chamber and sign up on the sheet near the entrance. For virtual testimony, you can sign up using our online form on our council budget review website or by emailing the committee at ccc.wm at boston.gov. When you are called to testify, please state your name and affiliation or address and limit your comments to two minutes to ensure that all comments and concerns can be heard. Email your written testimony to committee at ccc.wm and at boston.gov. Submit a two-minute video of your testimony through the form on our website. For more information on City Council budget process and how to testify, please visit the City Council's budget website at boston.gov forward slash council dash budget. The hearing, today's hearing is on docket 0480 to 0482, orders for the FY23 operating budget, including annual appropriations for departmental operations, for the school department, and for other post-employment benefits, OPEB. Docket 0483, orders for capital fund transfer appropriations. Docket 0484 to 0486, orders for the capital budget, including loan orders and lease purchase agreements. Our focus area for this hearing will be Mayor's Office of Immigrant Advancement, MOIA, Mayor's, and Mayor's Office of Women's Advancement, MOWA. A note uh, for my colleagues and those listening, during our budget review, we uh, try to listen to many departments as possible, and occasionally this will mean um, hearing from multiple departments in one hearing. Since we are going to um, be covering two departments in this hearing, we'll be attempting to manage um, in the following way. We will hear immigrant advancement first and then allow time for questions. Um, one, one round and then time permitting a second round. Um, and then we'll then do a round for public testimony um, and then we'll switch over to hear the questions um, for women's advancement. Um, should the counselors have additional questions then, um, and that times allow it, then we can follow up. And um, my staff or central staff will add your uh, follow-up questions um, to a post-hearing information request. Our panelists today uh, for today's hearing are Yusufi Valley outgoing director, Immigrant Advancement, Alex Valdez, <laughs> I shouldn't have said that, um, Alex Valdez, outgoing, ingoing, he'll, never mind, I don't know why, I didn't do that. Stop, Rosie. <laughs> Alex Valdez, director of Women's Advancement. Um, today, I am joined by my colleagues, Councillor Ruzi Lujen at large, Councillor Liz Braden, District 9, Councillor President Ed Flynn, District 2, Councillor Michael Flaherty at large, Councillor Kenzie Bach, District 8, Councillor Gabriela Coletta, District 1. Um, 
And now, without further ado, we'll go to your presentation, Office of Immigrant Advancement first, and then um, on to the second department. Um, you will have 10 minutes each to present, um, and then on to questions. Please state your name and uh, position and affiliation for the record. Um, thank you so much, Councillor. So my name is Yusuf Ivali, uh, Director for the Mayor's Office for Immigrant Advancement, and uh, um, just want to thank all the councillors uh, for the opportunity here to have this hearing. Um, uh, now, many of you, I'm sure, are familiar, um, and I know you are familiar with our office and what we do, but I just want to take this opportunity to also um, share with the constituents and the public a little bit about the Mayor's Office for Immigrant Advancement and what we've done and what we uh, are planning to do in the coming year. Um, our office has, and I think I can get this, yeah. Uh, our office has um, four areas of focus that really guide how we approach our work and achieve our mission. Um, of course, recognizing that immigrants who live in Boston have a range of experiences, needs, and contributions to make to our communities. These four buckets, which you see up on the screen, um, I really see as kind of keys of success for our immigrant residents. Um, immigrants re residents have to feel safe and stable um, here. And, uh, that's why, for instance, uh, having immigration status is just so important uh, for them to thrive. Um, economic integration, being able to have a good paying job and increase in, in, in their wages and wealth is uh, obviously another really important key to success. Uh, social integration, uh, the idea that you can integrate your home identity with your Boston identity and really feel at home here in Boston. Um, uh, being who, who you are from back home is really important. And also, when we think about, for instance, mental health needs, which you know every resident faces, right? But how is that delivered in a culturally sensitive you know, way, such that they, they really can socially be stable and, and integrate? Uh, and then the last piece is civic ownership. And here, um, I know we all believe so much in uh, engagement and ensuring that our services and programs are, 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 uh, are engaging our immigrant residents, but also really how are they at the table crafting and designing these programs uh, such that they're really meeting the needs. Um, now, um, our, uh, we address these four buckets by really as Moya playing the following four roles within the city of Boston. So the first is being a liaison, uh, a really bridge between city hall and our immigrant communities. So when, uh, and if an immigrant resident sees a particular need or a challenge on the ground, we want them to connect with us. Or if they're having challenges with a particular department connecting there, then we can be that conduit to that department and really help that department uh, get better at serving the, our immigrant residents. Um, the second role is really as consultant, and that's really advising the mayor and other city departments on um, you know, how to respond to, to uh, events, policies, and, and programs. And um, a good example of this is um, um, how back, back in the summer when we had a number of Haitian arrivals come here, we really pulled together a number of departments to, to serve those arrivals put an unprecedented $233,000 of ARPA monies into supporting that, which then our Haitian community partners were able to leverage and push the state to put an additional $8 million of ARPA monies into that support. Um, uh, the third role we play is as an advocate, and that's really to publicly lend our voice, the mayor's voice, the city's voice, to our immigrant communities and recommend policies affecting immigrants to the mayor. So a great example of this is uh, the driver's license bill, which um, I know so many of you and, of course, Mayor Wu has been uh, a, a huge advocate for, and, and I'm excited that hopefully it's going to get passed soon. Um, and then the last area uh, that we do play a role in is, is uh, as a direct programmer. Uh, but our programs are really meant to be um, uh, designed in such a way that they are, we design the program and they're meant to create a change reaction such that there's transformative change for our immigrant communities. And a great example of that is our Immigrant Lead Boston course. We've put now 39 immigrant residents through this over two years. Um, and this is a 12-week course on how the city works, how the budget works, um, uh, and they get to meet with different directors and chiefs. Uh, and, and, and my real hope is five years down the line, we have a bench of 100 immigrant leaders, many of them serving on commissions, many of them perhaps applying for jobs, and, and all of them really communicating 
how City Hall works with their, uh, within their own immigrant community such that this, this body, um, the, the, the city government is really in a transformative way serving all of our immigrant um, residents uh, um, in a way that's, that's culturally competent. Um, now the one thing our department is not meant to be is a one-stop shop. Um, and uh, you know, for, for me actually success would be when uh, we didn't need a MOYA. Uh, in city government because every, uh, every department would be amazing at being able to serve all of uh, uh, our immigrant residents. Um, so that's Moya's role. Um, I just want to take a, a moment to acknowledge my staff. I really feel I have the best staff in City Hall. You can see their faces right there. Uh, we're 11 full-time, one employment um, agreement, um, one person on employment agreement. Uh, between us, we have 11 different ancestries, uh, over 16 different languages represented of our staff. And um, these folks put in incredibly hard work uh, for our residents, and I just want to thank them, as well as so many of our city colleagues uh, that have been amazing partners, as well as community partners on the ground, and of course, you all as uh, city councilors. Um, uh, so just uh, I don't want to spend too much time on the FY22 accomplishments. They're listed there, and you can kind of read them. Um, uh, and, and I'm happy to take questions uh, on this as well. But the one thing I'll just say is that we are still recovering, and our, particularly our low-income immigrants are recovering from COVID. Um, uh, and so the one, I'll just point out that we uh, did use a million dollars of ARPA money to provide basic needs assistance to particularly folks that did not get any federal benefits. Um, you know, during, uh, during COVID. And, and, and like I said, there's a number of other programs. I know so many of the counselors have been to, for instance, Citizenship Day. Um, uh, counselor, I know we recently, uh, Counselor Anderson, I know we recently partnered on the community of Thar uh, out there. And uh, so thank you for your partnership there. Um, uh, but happy to take any questions on any of these programs. Um, uh, I wanna just take a, a moment to talk about the proposed investments. Um, you know, the big storyline is that our budget is gonna be growing by $1.1 million, and that is the most growth um, um, uh, in, in the history of Moya. And uh, I'm grateful to Mayor Wu for making the largest investment into this, this office. Um, uh, now I'll talk about specifically our three investments that we're, uh, we're proposing here. And um, the first one is around expanding access to immigration legal services. And here's the context to that. Um, first and foremost, uh, the number one, uh, immigration legal help is the number one issue that our office gets contact about, contacted about for constituent services. Number two is, you all know about the Greater Boston Immigrant Defense Fund. Um, I, we're proud as a city put in $100,000. We are the only public funder to that. Uh, fund. I have to say that unfortunately private ph philanthropy after President Biden's um, uh, election has stepped away from the Greater Boston Immigrant Defense Fund. And um, even though the legal, immigration legal needs are, like I said, the number one piece that folks are calling us about. Um, and then the third, reason, the third cont context to, to why we propose this half a million dollar investment is that um, uh, we actually had the opportunity in FY22, as President Biden did create some uh, legal pathways like TPS to pilot a really interesting way of providing immigration legal services, which was to build legal capacity directly within our immigrant serving CBOs. Great example of this is the Immigrant Family Services Institute in Mattapan, uh, which hired a, a couple of Haitian lawyers and also trained their staff right within the CBO to begin to serve um, our, our Haitian residents that qualify for TPS. And this worked really powerfully. And so based on that learning, uh, we decided to uh, propose this um, a half a million dollar investment. And what it would do is essentially give grants to hire culturally competent attorneys, hire paralegals, case coordinators, and pay for D DOJ accreditation training processes. And, and like I said, building that capacity right within the CBOs as opposed to the bigger legal aid organizations. Uh, so that's the first investment. The second investment is uh, our Immigrant Professionals Fellowship. There are so many immigrants in the, state, uh, in, in the city that 
and, and the state um, who have experience, uh, who, have, uh, who, are, who are trained back home in particular industries, but are not working in those same industries here. And so what we've done is part with, with the African Bridge Network to create a three-month fellowship. Um, this is in the medical industry uh, at, at four uh, uh, of the best hospitals in the world to give them the experience and the pathway to enter into this. We had 10 folks that were part of this pilot. Five of them have already gotten jobs, and we, we're very confident the rest will as well. And what we're doing is expanding this program. We've actually brought some other private funders to it, to 25 folks now, 15 of them funded um, with the city of Boston. Um, so I don't want to take away from my colleague. I'll just wrap up by saying that uh, the Dreamers Fellowship, which I'm sure you all are really, really aware of, um, we want, we did this program over the summer with 200 kids. Uh, we want to up that to 480 kids throughout uh, the year. Um, and, and I can get more into the question and answer uh, session about that. Just the last slide is what are our goals in addition to our investment, which again, I can speak to in the question and answer session. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to my colleague. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for having us here. It's such a pleasure to come and speak about the amazing work that we do in the Office of Women's Advancement. And I'll do my best to stick to our 10 minutes, um, and I'll go in through the, one of the, the most important slides to make sure that I'm being respectful of the time. So a little bit over the, what the Office of Women's Advancement do, I wanted to bring just a little bit of overview, um, sort of a refresher of what, um, of what we do. Um, our mission is to promote gender equity by empowering, um, empowering women and removing systematic barriers to their advantage. The way that we do work in the Office of Women's Advancement is we focus in different buckets. Um, one of them being economic equity, safety, and empowerment. Under those buckets, we have our work with pay equity, entrepreneurship, childcare, which has been a lot of our success in the office, um, and also safety when it comes to human trafficking, um, empowerment when it comes to visibility and contributions to public life. I'll skip over some of the, um, some of the population, but just to give some numbers, um, so we all know, right, Boston is home to 351,000 women and girls. Right? So this is the data as of 2018. Um, make up 52% of Boston's population. And um, we can dive more into the, the actual numbers, but I want to make sure that we go through the rest of the slides. Um, a little bit of the programming that we do in the office. Um, we Currently, we have worked very alongside the Women's Workforce Council in the launch of our wage gap calculator, and I'll get to that in one of my other slides. Um, salary negotiation workshops, our child care entrepreneur fund who helps us help in-home child care providers when it comes to um, training and also helps them around in monetary support and as to what they see fit in using the funds for, and also allows them to engage and empower one another and work together with other child care providers in the city of Boston. In that same bucket, we include also our child care survey, which our sur the survey has helped us shape the way that we do programming when it comes to child care in the city of Boston. And of some upcoming projects that we have um, is reshaping the, the mayor's office of wo women's advancement. And how do we see the office moving forward in the no fiscal year, but also how do we engage with the community in helping us reframe and redo all of the work that the office does to make sure that it's being fully representative of all the women and those who identify as is in the city of Boston. A little bit of our work in economic equity, like I mentioned earlier, um, closing the wage gap. In order to solve complex problems, we must apply a multi-program approach. Um, and we make sure that we do that by working with the Women's Workforce Council. Um, the, Bo the Boston model is made up of three parts, which is employers, individual women, and legislation. The Women's Workforce Council is a public-private partnership between the City of Boston and the Greater Boston Businesses Communities to eliminate, to eliminate the gender-racial wage gap and make our city the best place um, 
The council oversees a 100% talent compact, a pledge business is signed to commit to access their own data to see the wage gap exists. And this data helps us allow to be able to gain information as to what our employers doing to help us close the gender wage gap and what are we as a city and employers doing to also help and make sure that we are providing the appropriate information and also benefits to be able to close that gap take steps to address those gaps, and anonymously provide data to the BWWC to access progress to the city as a whole in closing the wage gap. Recently, in collaboration with the Women's Workforce Council, we have been able to launch and create the Employer Wage Gap Calculator. This has been um, such an amazing project to work on throughout the year, and also our partners at BU, and everyone from the Workforce Council and the team at Women's Advancement to help us create this tool. Um, the calculator is easy to use and it helps employers actually do the math. And based on the data from the 2021 wage gap report, um, April 20th marks the Boston Equal Pay Day, resembling the number of days into 2022 that women must work in order to earn to pay in 2021. And I'm very more than happy to share the link to the actual calculator. Um, and it's a great tool for any employer to be able to sign up and put in their data and their current employer data to help them calculate. Um, and the way that we always do this, and I'm happy, we're always in the process of looking as to obtaining the data and see how many people have used the calculator, who has access to the calculator, and also the many times that people have engaged. Um, the calculator launched a little bit less than a month ago, um, so we're gonna give it a little bit of time as to where we can see the actual data reporting. Um, and we're really excited excited to see how many employees are actually interacting, how many employees are downloading the data, and also how many employers are also beginning to get more involved to sign up to be compact signers to the Women's Workforce Council. Some of the data through the Women's Workforce Council, these are the 2021 data findings. Um, women on average working full time in the greater Boston area make zero, 70 cents on a man's dollar, 30 cents an increase from 2017. 2021 sample represented 13.5% of the workforce, which titles to 155,000 employees. Happy to also provide and send the full report of the Women's Workforce Council on the data to be able to give forth. Excuse me, um, Ms. Valerie. Um, feel free to slow down a little bit so that okay. the people at home, yeah. um, you have a lot of sometimes um, people that, you know, with hearing issues or um, it's kind of hard to listen to data when you're going like really fast like that. Yeah, of course. Don't worry about the time. I'll give you more time. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I'll be happy to go back and to make sure that we go over it. Some of the data and the numbers that I'm going to mention is based on the 2021 data findings from this Workforce Council report that was just released. Zero, 70 cents on a man's dollar, the average wage gap is 36 cents. Six cents increase from 2017. And again, these reports are all public and happy to share with anyone who might need access to them. 2021 sample represented that 13.5% of the workforce, which is 155,000 employees. The next slide shows the earnings ratio on women by race compared to white men in 2021. Gaps are also varied by race with the largest gender wage gaps among black and African American and Hispanic and Latina women. I move on to one of the great in engagements and program that currently the office um, do is our salary negotiations, Harvard policy analysis. As we all know in the past, the Office of Women's Advancement has been very lucky to offer free salary negotiations to all women and those who identify as in the city of Boston. Um, and helping us through that process currently is our partnership with the Harvard Kennedy School in regards to focusing in how do we address and focus on re and salary negotiation workshops to be more inclusive and inclusive when it comes to non-salarial workers, low-income populations, marginalized populations, and partners in caregiving re-entering the workforce. One of the reasons why we wanted to come in and look into how do we are reimagining our salary negotiation classes is to make sure that we are being accepted, make sure that we are being um, supportive in all aspects and not just focus on salary. Because we all know that not every single woman and those who identify as women are salary workers in the city of Boston. Moving on to um, our childcare work, which 
in FY23, our child care work will be moving over to the new, newly announced Office of Early Education. So a little bit about the program. Um, it's a two-part program that supports small women and minority-owned family child care businesses in the city of Boston. It enhances child care access to Boston families. Um, and like I mentioned before, in FY23, the program is moving to the new Office of Early Childhood under Human Services. The program helps stabilize and assist new family child care through businesses, offering a 3,500 grant, um, and also helps empower family child care educators with business skills for their sector through a six workshop curriculum, including budgeting, contracts, and record keeping. I do say that the, the beginning when we first started the classes for the Child Care Entrepreneur Fund, um, and I thank all of you for the ongoing support and investment in the program. Um, it has been very successful that we've been able to help so many child care providers in the city of Boston, which majority have been women of color, and I'll give numbers in a second. But I just wanted to offer and thank you guys for the ongoing support. As to continue, why is needing? As of September 2021, Boston lost 13.6% of its licensed child care programs that were open pre-pandemic. It's about 72 family child care providers and 20 centers. From December 2017 to March 2021, the number of seats available for children zero to five years fell by 11.3%. Boston child care providers are amongst the most vulnerable workers. 92% are women, 62% women of color, and 39% are immigrants, and an average earning of $33,120. And a little bit of the Child Care Entrepreneur Fund by the numbers, so we have an idea of exactly where the funds and how many family care providers we have helped, and I'll go through this. Um, in FY20, 21 participants participated in the winter cohort, which allowed us to give $73,500 in grant funding. FY22 to date, 22 participants, summer, fall cohort 2021, 47 participants in a Spanish only winter cohort 2022, 65 child care entrepreneurs graduated and allowed us to give $66,500 in grant funding and a total of 161 to be awarded soon. There's currently a cohort um, as we speak that is currently finishing their classes. FY21, 50 participants participated fall, in the summer fall. 35 participated winter spring, which allowed us 77 childcare entrepreneurs graduated and in, in 20 in Spanish. And that was a full awarding of 269,500 just in grant funding. And in FY22, which is currently 34 participants, 18 in Spanish, is currently ongoing. I know I'm out of time, but I'm happy to take any questions in regards to our child care survey or any other program that the Office of Women's Advancement currently does. Like I mentioned earlier, um, this is a great time for the office as we are looking to reimagine and reshape what, the, what does our office look like and what will our mission focus on. And I really hope that I can count and work with all of you all when it comes to when I change in that mission and working together, and I look forward to all your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Ms. Uh, Valdez. Uh, and now, um, Councillor Lujan, you have the floor. Thank you uh, for being here. Thanks to the administration. Um, I am. Uh, I think that the work you do is incredibly, incredibly important. Um, as a daughter of Haitian immigrants, as a woman, um, I know that you all are providing very vital services. So, Ms. Valdez, I'll start with you. One question I have is, have and, and apologies, I don't think you said this, but if you said this and I missed it, apologies. Uh, has there been an internal study done on City Hall in terms of the pay gap, any pay gap? So the city of Boston is actually the is actually one of our compact signers. Um, so the data is available as to it, and I'm more than happy to send the full report. And what does the data say about is the, is there a pay gap, a pay disparity in City Hall between um, male and female employees? I'm happy to share the data. I don't know the data at the top of my head. I don't want to give the wrong numbers, um, but I'll be more than happy to give those numbers. Okay. Um, then the next questions I have are uh, for. Uh, uh, Yusufi, um, and thanks for all the incredible work that you do. Um, it says that um, we're, 
there's a half half a million dollars that we're going to be allocating in addition for fiscal year 23 to do capacity building and then there would we'd have one full-time employee what would that full who would that full-time employee be yeah and what is the vision there so um we we had uh you know on our fy 2022 we had a contractor that was essentially our legal access coordinator were they a lawyer um they're not a lawyer but they come from uh, a background of um uh, having worked with an agency that does very similar work, um, and um, they, they and, and this was actually when when the whole DACA thing had, uh, happened in 2014, I think it was. Sorry, 2013. Yeah, guys, might slap would let me know. Mm -hmm. um, um, we had a similar coordinator that helped uh, do clinics and and that piece of it. So um, uh, so this person anyway has been with the staff. They're now going to be full time uh, on board, and um, uh, they'll be helping reaching out to uh, potential universities to bring in uh, legal help. We're also at this point considering a rocket docket workshop because, as as you know, uh, there's a number of Haitians, Brazilians mm -hmm. um, coming up here, and uh, the federal government is doing a rocket docket here um, in the area, which is basically a judge that's processing these. Uh, uh, asylum cases in a much, much quicker way. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that our uh, immigrants coming up here don't actually know their rights, right? So this person is working to create kind of those workshops in a similar way to what you experienced at Citizenship Day, uh, but particularly focusing on, uh, on, on this. Yeah. I'm wondering if you think there would be any benefit to having a lawyer in-house um, at Moya, given the fact that, you know, one of the complaints that I hear often yeah. from people who attend these sessions, you know, free immigrant consulta consultation, and then what? Yeah, They're often left, you know, needing help or trying to figure it out totally. and they can't. Um, and of course, I don't believe this lawyer would be the one to answer all, or to act as the attorney, right? Because they're alive, yeah. you know, we're not yeah. going down that road. But I think there could be some benefit to having a lawyer on staff to help triage some issues and really deepen those relationships and partnerships with um, universities or, um, you know, helping to build that long-term capacity with Brazilian Worker Center, with IFC, with yeah. all these other organizations that are doing that. Um, would, love, would love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, you know, I, we've actually explored that, uh, Counselor, and, and I think the, I know previously when we'd spoken to legal, I think the issue is the liability side of it, um, which is why we've instead decided on a strategy of um, granting monies to the CBOs where they can actually bring in lawyers from their particular backgrounds right into, you know, the organization. But it's honestly, it's, it's my understanding is it's more, largely a liability issue, which is why we haven't uh, done that. We do have a lawyer by training on staff. Um, he's our senior policy advisor. Um, and he is an immigration lawyer. And, uh, um, I cannot recall right now exactly what he's trained in, um, uh, but um, he, he knows the field incredibly well, I will say that. Um, and uh, so we're, we're blessed to have him. Is there work that you can do internally to make those clinics that every other Wednesday, I believe they are, yeah. to make them more effective for those who attend? Uh, it's, uh, we're certainly looking at different cities and what they've done. Um, you know, it's dependent on pro bono lawyers. Um, so that's, I think, the big challenge with that program, right? Um, and again, for liability reasons, the city can't really be in a position to pay, pay private attorneys to, you know, uh, contract directly for that. Um, but we're very open to any other ideas of how to, you know, begin to, uh, meet that need because I totally agree with you. It's it's the biggest need, and I appreciate you raising it. Um, so the Greater Boston Immigrant Defense Fund. You mm -hmm. said you've also stated that uh, the private monies in that have dwindled yes. post the election of President Biden. Although, which is ironic because totally the issues have only augmented. Um, I'm curious um, what we can do to further buttress the Greater Boston Immigrant Defense Fund given that um, a lot of our private partners have pulled out? I mean, short of, um, uh, of really pushing the private partners to come to the table, um, you know, I think that the strategy we've put together here of a half a million dollar investment into these immigrant CBOs is 
as far as the city is concerned, I think a pretty sizable, you know, um, And so the, it, the plan is to invest more in that CBO and less in the Greater Boston Immigrant Defense Fund? Right, exactly. I, I mean, we will keep our $100,000 investment into the fund. How much is in the fund at the moment? Um, so for this year, and I'll get you the exact numbers, but um, so let's don't quote me on this, but I, I believe it's about $600,000 this past year, but the private funders have been um, really clear that the coming year, there's not going to be that same amount of support. Um, and so I expect it to dwindle to two to three hundred thousand dollars. Okay. Um, you know, so you, you mentioned legal. What are the other issues that immigrants are coming to Moya with that, you know, you're like regrettably because of staff capacity or whatever issue we're not able to address and, and where it would be good that we, if we could. Yeah. Well, you know, I think that last slide, I didn't get a chance to cover it, mm -hmm. um, but uh, there's, there's uh, two specific areas that I think there is a real opportunity um, uh, in this next year for the Moya team to come up with a real plan around for this council. Uh, and that's uh, one is really on uh, USL classes, mm -hmm. uh, which I know Council Braden has been a big advocate of as well. Uh, I just think we need as a city a real clear roadmap around that such that there's no one on a waiting list. That would be the North Star I'd love to shoot for. Uh, but we need a real clear plan and strategy around that. Mm -hmm. So I personally don't feel like we're ready for funding on that. Uh, but I do think we can spend this coming year, um, you know, really crafting that piece out. Uh, we've got some great partners in the community in English for New Bostonians, uh, and obviously the Office of Workforce Development does good work on that. Uh, but I, I just, that's, that's, um, that's an area that I would have loved as, if I were continuing as the Moya Director to spend a lot of time with uh, on. Uh, the second area is mental health needs is, is really big in the immigrant community right now. Um, Post-COVID, that's one of the biggest needs identified. And what we actually just did this, um, in this past fiscal year is uh, gave $70,000 to seven different immigrant serving CBOs that are doing non-clinical um, interventions uh, around mental health. And uh, based on, uh, and we have an evaluation partner um, you know, for this grant as well. And depending on what we learn from this, this process, uh, we're hoping to make a couple of recommendations to BPHC uh, uh, that get rolled up into its mental health strategy um, uh, uh, so that we can also begin to provide a more holistic way of supporting our uh, immigrant residents around uh, the mental health issues. Uh, I think I will say that, you know, um, my amazing colleague, Ms. Waldas, noted about childcare being a huge issue, which, you know, I think um, it's, 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 it's amazing that there's investment that's going into that. Uh, because certainly so many of the providers are immigrants and it's a huge need for immigrants as it is, as you know, for, for uh, city at large. Uh, thank you. Um, another question is you talked about how we provided during COVID, uh, I forget the name of the program, but cash assistance yeah. is, uh, to our um, undocumented. Um, I don't know if we made a difference between undocumented, but can you just go over sort of a little bit in more detail what that cash assistance looked like and, and what is the plan for yeah. uh, uh, FY23? Let me just, uh, one second, let me just pull up the demographics on that program. And I'll explain the program in a second as well. Um, I think I have the demographics, or maybe I don't right now. Um, but um, essentially what it was is a is million dollars from ARPA, um, and it was to the targeted population. I, I just say that it really targeted anyone that didn't receive federal um, benefits, which could be undocumented, but it could also be folks that actually, you know, were potentially uh, documented that just didn't get it. Um, uh, and um, it essentially was a $750 on average payment um, to folks. Um, and, you know, I, um, if we can, I'll, I'll get my staff to send me an email on the demographic data, and I can share that with you a little bit later. But really diverse immigrant communities benefit from this, really low-income folks, folks that were struggling in the pandemic um, to, to have any kind of job. And can I just ask, what was the application process? Like, how did people find out about it? Yeah, um, um, yeah so uh, the, the way the program worked is there was an RFP process. There was um, uh, different uh, uh, organizations that applied. Um, 
the Massachusetts Immigrant Collaborative is the one that got, was with the winning kind of grantee of this. Um, this is a collaborative of 15 immigrant orgs uh, that work with the population that, you know, uh, did not get those federal benefits. Um, and um, they publicized the application and, and we publicized certainly in the, in the media and um, anyone was able to contact um, you know, these different orgs to, to get that. Many folks contacted us, but what I liked about this program was because it was really these immigrant serving orgs running it. Um, the application was in their particular languages. There was someone that was ready to, you know, ask them questions in, in, in their language and that piece of it, so. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Council Braden, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Yusufi, and thank you. Um, Alex, thank you for being here. Um, a few questions. Um, the, the Child uh, Care Entrepreneurial Fund, how many, um, it's a great program and I really appreciate it and how important it is and the family child care providers are really sort of the, the, the backbone of our system in allowing culturally um, competent um, and accessible childcare for our, many of our immigrant, uh, uh, jobs for immigrant and, and, and business opportunities for immigrants, but also childcare for immigrants. So it's really, really important. How many um, family childcare um, centers have opened as a result of the training or are we just uh, um, doing capacity building and already existing childcare providers? So we're doing a little bit of both. Um, the grants are titled to um, those who are currently opening child care providers. During our last funding, um, we were able to grant, if I'm not mistaken, and, um, about two who were just opening. We have seen more of the larger numbers for continuing supporting currently open family child care providers who are using the funds specifically to help rebuild from COVID. Yeah. And I think you know some of the the help with budgeting and record keeping and and, and developing good contracts mm -hmm. and it it really helps them streamline their processes and and make sure that they they get paid for the services that they deliver. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the salary negotiation workshops, they've been going since about 2015, I understand. Um, have you been tracking the outcomes and uh, do you follow up with the participants and who who enrolls in those uh, workshops? Yeah, so um, the, fam the salary negotiations once, and I'll backtrack a little bit, um, once we were during COVID, they were fully online, um, and we did see a huge spike in the numbers of those who actually took the classes. Um, and I think the numbers are on the, um, the packet, but I'm, I can look at them and reread them again. Um, Currently, what we have been doing is in the sense of reframing them to make sure that we are being fully supportive to those who are not just salarial workers. Um, and that's what we're looking forward to do now and moving forward. As to following up with the salary negotiations, those who attended, um, Previously, from before me joining the Office of Women's Advancement, I attended myself some of the salary negotiations um, and the way that the office follow up was sort of in regards to thanking them for coming and seeing how else um, the Office of Women's Advancement can be supportive to those who attended, which is something that we are looking forward to continuing doing once we restart the new um, salary negotiations in the fall. Okay. And um, then, Yusufi, um, I really appreciate um, the work and your partnership with um, the Gardner Pilot Academy and their adult education program for our immigrant families to help them learn English. So many of our, do we have any metrics on the number of, uh, and the breakdown of English language classes and, and whether um, the folks that I'm always concerned about are the folks who don't speak little or no English yeah. and they're, they're new to the country and you really need to be able to um, get some of those skills so they can earn more money and be better advocates uh, if, if to have a better understanding of English and be able to better advocate for their families and for themselves. Yeah, I mean, right, right now, you know, Councillor, um, and I know you've been championing this, um, Samoya contributes $50,000 to EMB, and that's what we did in 2022. Um, and that funding partly has helped um, 
not fully, of course, but full, uh, helped uh, fund 18 ESL programs serving approximately 900 immigrants in the city. Um, in terms of the, the exact data that you're asking me, I, I need to go back to the NBA and exactly get that, but that's a big reason that if I were staying in my position, I'd want to really create that EOSL roadmap and really get clear on some of that data kind of moving forward. Uh, but we'll, we'll work to get that to you. Very good. And I, I really appreciate your, your commitment to, um, what you say, a clear plan and strategy for decreasing the waiting list for ESL, ESOL classes. Like I, I went to a community meeting way back, I think it was a town hall with Congressman Capuano, Capuano oh, 20 years ago, and that was the big issue was, how do we get English language classes for folks who speak very little English so that they can really um, advance and, and make progress uh, as quickly as possible. Um, so really appreciate your work and anything we can do to help elevate that um, plan and strategy and decreasing those waiting lists is really, just let us know what we can do to help. Um, the other, you know, I'm interested, you know, the professional, the folks who come in with professional healthcare backgrounds and I'm a, I came as an immigrant but I, I speak English and I was able yeah. to get a job, right, you know, I was, I was hired from overseas to come and work. Um, how many folks are we able to help get, get, get um, transition? I think you said it in your, in your, um, in your, uh, presentation and, and which, this is the Center for Excellence and, and edu Medical Education and, and Care yeah. in, in, in the world here in Boston. Yeah. How many folks are managing to segue into jobs in, in the healthcare sector and, and which, um, if you're able to share, which, um, which healthcare institutions are partnering with you on that? Yeah, so we had um, 10, uh, we, we piloted a program with 10 folks, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, four were Haitian, one was Ghanaian, one was Ghanaian, um, one was Arab Sudanese, one was Cameroonian, and there's two Nigerians. Um, and um, we, uh, so f five of them uh, have landed a job. Um, I don't know exactly which hospital, but I can figure that out. Yeah. Um, and we are actually really confident with that, the coaching that support that our nonprofit partner on this African Bridge Network was providing. Um, feel really confident that actually the others will also, uh, but they're getting into that field. Um, and, um, you know, now we're going to, like I said, expand that to 25 folks, but 15 of them will be Boston residents. Um, so, yeah, and, and really, actually, the long term goal is how do we expand that to even other industries? Um, you know, I was just talking to um, John Regan at Associate Industries of Massachusetts, and he is saying that there's such a labor shortage in a number of different industries. And the key thing to understand and why this program, I think, is really successful is that the, the work experience piece is what really is the limiting factor uh, for most folks. English is definitely a big piece of it, so people have to have, build that skill set. But the other piece is really, once they work with someone in that industry, their network grows, they get a better sense of the soft skills that are necessary here, and usually it ends up leading um, to, to a job. Now, the bigger challenge here is, um, you know, these are these are non-clinical jobs that they're getting into, because really the state needs to shift its certification guidelines and modernize them um, to 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 the to the reality that we have folks really from all over the world yeah. with the, with that experience. So that's the big barrier that. Um, I'd really like to solve, and I think what we're doing with this program is showing a little bit of proof of concept. Um, yeah. And you know, Mayor Wu and we're really committed to pushing the state to begin to shift the licensure requirements. Yeah, I really appreciate that. And, and you know, you hear anecdotally, you hear stories of of judges from some country. There were a judge in their own country, and they're here, and they're they're, right. they're janitors here. Or you hear of um, you know surgeons working, and you know. We have a lot of talent and a lot of experience, and finding ways to utilize that experience is really, really wonderful. Absolutely, it's a win-win uh, across the board for everyone uh, if we can get folks in the right industry. So, very good. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Council Braden. Councilor President Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the panelists for the important work that you're doing in the city. 
Um, I've had an opportunity to work with Yusuf for, I don't know, maybe five years now on, on many issues, and just want to say you do an excellent job for the residents, residents of Boston. So I want to say thank you to you and, and to Ms. Valdez for your, your work as well. Um, so my, my first question, I guess, the funding that you, you're providing to help on immigration legal counsel is going to support Brazil, I mean, um, the Bra uh, Brazilian workers um, network, is that what the name of the group is? The Brazilian Workers Center, but uh, no, Council, we, we, we would need to do an, um, uh, an RFA process oh, okay. for, for that. Um, uh, those are like, um, we would want to fund, uh, I think, legal capacity in organizations like that only because the most recent Im immigration into the city has been, um, uh, uh, and I shouldn't, most recent uh, immigration in the city with the most vulnerable needs, I should say, are Haitians, Brazilians, um, and Central Americans. Um, so I think that those are where the biggest needs for legal uh, capacity are. Um, but I, I, I would not say that we have a particular organization in mind at this point. Okay, okay, no, that's fine. Um, I'm familiar with a lot of those organizations that I've worked with, and but I think it's money well, well spent um, helping residents. One, one issue I wanted to bring up, and I, I certainly support that, one issue I wanted to bring up is, is what I'm seeing frequently. I was talking to a gentleman yesterday, actually. Council of Flaherty knows him as well. He's, he works with a cop in his union, Richard Petey, Richard mm. Petty, and he's, he's, he's calling me and he's talking to me about wage theft. Mm. And, and I know wage theft is a critical issue, um, especially impacting immigrant workers, and they're being exploited for various reasons, but one of the reasons is because of their immigration status at times. Um, I think one of the worst things you could do in, in life is steal someone's wages, especially when that person needs those wages to, <clears throat> to support a family. But anyway, I know, counts, I know Attorney General Mara Healy has been doing a lot of work on this. I've been working with the Chinese Progressive Association on this issue as well. Um, so what, what can we do to assist immigrant workers that are being exploited by unscrupulous um, business owners and they won't pay them a fair wage um, and they're using their immigration status to uh, withhold wages? Yeah. Uh, I think it's um, such a good, a question and such an important area need. So thank you, Councilor, for kind of raising this. Um, you know, I, I think um, our team can do a little bit more investigation on what we can as a city do around this. I know when the Human Rights Commission was being established, I was very excited for that because I do think it has the power to call people into hearings. And, um, uh, you know, those employers that are practicing these unscrupulous practices I could see an opportunity for the Human Rights Commission to play a role there. Um, beyond that, I, I just tr very transparently, I think this is an issue that we need to look at more carefully and uh, happy to come back to you with some other tactics and strategies around this. Okay, that would be great. Um, and that's something that's, that's very important. And know what, I, know what I, I also know is a lot of immigrant workers are exploited not just by refusal to, refusal to pay them their decent their, their salary or their wage, but they're, they're not giving them the same safety conditions, protections um, on the job. So that's also a major concern. So it's important that we work with businesses and in organized labor, and organized labor really advocates for all workers, regardless of Absolutely. their, um, w if they're in a union or not in a union. That's what I really respect about organized labor is they advocate for, for workers, period. Um, so one other issue, well, 
let me let me just go back to what Councilor Lu Jen mentioned. Um, so a woman worker in the greater Boston would get 70 cents for every dollar a man would make. Is that the figure that I, I thought I saw? Yeah, yeah, correct. Okay. So, but we don't have that figure for city of Boston employees. Currently, right now, I don't have it personally in front of me, um, but okay. I'm happy to um, find out the from from the report and happy to send that to you. Okay, yeah, that would be helpful because yeah. I I would like to see that. When when I look at stats, I always see how Boston is measuring up. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I encourage businesses to hire returning citizens with the quarry. And then, but then I also asked the city of Boston, what, do you, what are we doing in terms of hiring returning citizens with the quarry? So I want to make sure that we're also, you know, living up to our, our whatever the word is. Um, <clears throat> so let me see what else I, I have to say here. Um, Councillor, if I may on yeah. the wage theft issue, I, I just want to say that that's why getting people immigration status is such an important strategy as well, because when they don't have status is when they're really vulnerable to the wage theft issue as mm -hmm. well. So just, and, and that's where I think the investment that we're putting in here around immigration legal services is actually a really solid one. Mm -hmm. um, so just, just to add, uh, add to that. Okay, yeah, and, and well, uh, the other point I was going to make is it actually Im 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 impacts um, the Women's Bureau and immigra Immigration Advancement, but um, domestic violence is an issue I've focused on, mm -hmm. especially in the immigrant community. And it impacts the immigrant community in, in high numbers in a lot of, especially women that, have, that are survivors of domestic, vi domestic violence, don't report the, this to the proper authorities because of the immigration status of, of, of maybe her or, or, the, um, or her spouse. Um, th the other issue is, and I do some work with the Asian Task Force against domestic violence, the other issue is language access. I've, I visited the Asian Task Force against domestic violence and their big, biggest challenge is, is language access. You know, they were t the executive director was telling me they don't have enough interpreters or someone to translate for them. So what, what are we doing in terms of looping in language access, language and communication access, the w Women's Bureau and Immigrant Advancement as it relates to domestic violence? Um, I can talk, if I, if I may. Um we, have, we partner very closely with um, the Public Safety Office, the Boston Police Department, Human Rights Commission, the Emma Coalition, and local survivors um, in, in the community specific to, um, to domestic violence. Um, and a lot of the work that we do around that is when it comes to race awareness. Um, during the pandemic, and we, and a couple of months ago, we were able to host a series of a lot of webinars and speaking with survivors and speaking with the different organizations as to coming together and convening and what are we doing um, to be able to tackle this issue and when it comes to finding best practices, right? And when it comes to the language access, a lot of the work, most of the work that we do in the office is very transparent when it comes to language. Um, all of our information and when it comes to our applications and everything that's distributed is pretty much translated in top 10 languages in the city of Boston, including all of our information when it comes to our web webinars and domestic violence and, and guides when it comes to that as well. And my, my final point, it's not, not a question, I'll just make a final point, I know my time is up. Um, there was an elderly Asian woman in, in Chinatown a couple of weeks ago, I think she was in her 80s, and she was punched uh, she was assaulted, really, by by a male, um, which I, I I made sure the Boston police knew about it and the Human Rights Commission knew about it. But we're still seeing a lot of violence against immigrants. We're seeing a lot of violence against AAPI community, hate crimes. But the Human Rights Commission can play a critical role. 
there's two ways to report the, um, incidents to the human rights anonymously or, or with your name. Uh, so I'd, I'd encourage people to do that. I've, I've filed many complaints in there. Um, I think I've filed the most complaints in the Human Rights Commission about various incidents that I've witnessed. Um, but anyway, um, thank you, Madam Chair, for giving me the uh, an extra minute, and thank you to the panelists for the important work you're doing. Uh, thank you, Council President Flynn. Council Flaherty, you have the floor. Very good. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and good afternoon, uh, Yusufi and Alex. And, uh, Yusufi, I, I just want to, uh, on a personal note, I, uh, I can't speak highly enough about uh, the work uh, that you and your office uh, do. Uh, you have a fantastic uh, reputation and track record. Uh, you've been a pleasure to work with. Uh, you're obviously a credit to your family and to your community uh, and wish you the very best as you're sort of uh, transitioning uh, your own personal and professional career uh, and we'll hopefully be seeing more of you. Uh, and I know that uh, you're the type that you're only as good as the team around you. You've got a great supporting cast uh, within your department. but. Uh, I have to tell you, I um, want to commend your commitment uh, to public service, your commitment to the residents of the city, particularly um, uh, our new Bostonians and immigrants that are just in search of, uh, and listening to you in your opening, linking about uh, sort of my ancestors' story. And uh, they came to this country at a time when it was uh, no Irish need apply and um, couldn't find work. And the work that was available uh, were, was mostly the most dangerous work and the most lowest paid, the lowest paid work. Uh, they were working uh, the railroad, they were working down at the docks, um, real dangerous activity, and um, had substandard housing, uh, no health care. Um, many relatives had died because of those conditions, but they, uh, they persevered, um, you know, based on um, obviously their faith and um, relationships that they built uh, in their new country, and uh, they got involved. They volunteered. They served our country uh, in, in the armed forces. Uh, they got on boards and commissions and they started civic associations. They ran for public office. Uh, they organized uh, labor activities uh, and joined the union. They pursued higher education for themselves uh, and for their families. Or um, they at least made sure that if they didn't have something, they would uh, work extremely hard to make sure that their child or grandchildren had uh, what they didn't have. And so that's the story. Uh, and those are the folks that uh, you've been representing and reaching out to and trying to connect to these very precious resources. So um, again, I just want to note that uh, it's been a pleasure to work with you in this capacity and look forward to working with you in your new capacity. Uh, and, uh, and with that, I'll uh, transition into uh, just a couple quick questions. Um, and Alex, obviously, to the, to the role that you're playing. And I wanted to dovetail on my colleague, Councilor Braden particularly around the uh, child care. Clearly, uh, child care is critical for working families. It's in, uh, increasingly very difficult to access, uh, and it's becoming more expensive. Clearly, the pandemic uh, impacted uh, that sector uh, tremendously, uh, arguably almost uh, decimated it in some respects. I guess the question I have is, are the funds intended to help bring back the licensed care providers or to help providers that may have been on the brink of closure or were forced to close because of the pandemic? Yeah, the funds, the funds are used for both, right? Um, the providers or those who are licensed can use the funds um, as to however they see fit that will best support their, their program. Um, and through the classes that they take, the six workshops, and they're able to analyze from, from start to finish as to when it comes to creating that business plan, when it comes to creating that pipeline of helping them re restructure, reframe um, their small business, um, but it's helped them to be able to come back from COVID, help them to be able to support when it came to purchasing um, a lot of the PPE that was from COVID. And now as we are stepping away that we are more enjoying being outside and the kids are able to go outside, it's helping them support to create that recreational space um, for the children in their care. And so I also noticed from our budget books that the child care is moving away from you, right, and to the Office of Early Childhood with respect to fiscal year 23. Yes. So uh, maybe your initial thoughts on that uh, is sort of that, is it uh, sort of, I guess, a better and more appropriate home for that? Or is that something that uh, you would 
prefer to sort of see where you're at in your in your capacity and as uh, as the director of women's advancement. Yeah, I think it was it was an amazing transition, and I think the work basically pivoted to that. Um, and I'm so thankful for Mary Rule's um, leadership when it comes to creating that new office. And this is why having the child care survey is so important. Having the child care entrepreneur fund was so important to give us that data and to give us that information that child care needs its own home and needs its own focus. And having this office to help create that one-stop shop is going to make it so much more elevated and continue to raise the importance that it, that it has. And the outreach for the child care workers, can you just sort of explain sort of what that, what's that process been like in terms of or what, what outreach efforts have been made, whether they're still up and running or whether they, we might have had a, a good one that had to close. Uh, how are we communicating with those folks and maybe trying to get them back up and running and that $3,500 is sort of what's the process by which uh, that can be uh, assigned to that child care company and or for what purposes can they use the 3500 yeah, uh, so it's an application process which is um, it opens every time that the fund um, is available. All our, our applications are in the top 10 languages for the city, um, and if obviously there's a language that's not represented, uh, we are more than happy to translate if it's not within those 10 languages. The outreach process is very intense. Um, I make sure, we make sure that it's a process that's very transparent from holding listening sessions, from holding information sessions, um, to have providers attend and just answer any questions, to also making sure that we are keeping in touch with all the previous providers. Um, we make sure that we call, we email, we check, and also throughout the process of the workshops, we are able to host and create that sense of family within all of them, to be able to keep in touch with all the providers. And it also gives us the ability to sort of create a shared space where we're sharing information as well from other organizations within, and uh, in regards to your question as to how they can use the 3500, um, we pretty much leave it as um, they are the experts in their own business. And they know what's best and what fits best in, in their own um, business plan. So we assure that throughout the six classes, they have all the tools needed to create that working plan as to what they will use the funds for. Great. That's good. And thank you for the work that you do. And look forward to working with you forward. And just lastly, Al Pine, uh, my colleague who's, who had just stepped out um, uh, Council Luigi and she talked about having sort of a uh, in-house legal services, which mm -hmm. makes sense. I obviously hear your argument on sort of incurring the liability with that, or at least having someone in. It just struck me that you know our, our Boston Public School system. Um, we had a situation over at, at, at the Mission School, and they took it upon themselves. They didn't call 911 or reach out to the Boston Police Sexual Assault Unit. They didn't call the DA's office to talk about the child abuse unit. They engaged a private law firm and spent over a quarter of a million dollars, I think $252,000 based on their budget, uh, money that would have been, frankly would have been better spent. They didn't need to spend that money. They just needed to call um, the Boston Police Sexual Assault Unit. They needed to call the DA's Child Abuse Unit, or they could have just dialed in for a 51A. Instead, um, they hired a private law firm um, with, uh, I guess a, 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 their own discretionary funds, if you will, but they didn't come to this body asking for the expenditure. Um, and so your your department, obviously, that it, that's doing sort of significant and meaningful work for, for residents, new Bostonians, you know, would have been, you know, could you imagine what you could have done with uh, $252,000 of legal services and answering those questions? So again, that's, you know, that's me opining about it, but uh, I just want to let you know, when you have a budget this big, uh, or in that instance, a school department where the bureaucracy is just so big, uh, and bloated that you know these extra funds just kind of pop up out of nowhere. They sort of come here hat in hand, sort of sort of begging, scratching and clawing, asking that they need more money. But then you learn that they spend uh, money so foolishly like that. So, but again, uh, best of luck in your new endeavors. Thank you both for your time and attention and your experience here. And uh, hopefully, whoever your replacement is will be cut from the same cloth uh, and will have your same passion and energy uh, and willingness to work with uh, members of the council, but also work with uh, every corner of the, I see you everywhere. I mean, you're everywhere all across the city. Uh, at one point I thought you might be running for city council at large, right? <laughs> I see you so places, right? So I'll just let you know, if you stay in, either you're in Flynn's district or you're in Tanya Fernandez's district, but uh, nonetheless, uh, best of luck to you and to your family. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate the, uh, the indulgence. Councilor, I, I have no reason to run when you're, when you're in the position yeah, that you, you are, you. right? Appreciate <laughs> that. Uh, your community has been very good. No, but I, I, on a serious note, thank you so much for your kind, kind words, and, and I've just been really blessed to have an amazing team, and, and frankly, uh, really supportive uh, mayors and, and a really supportive council. And so it's a real 
the work is a real credit to you all and a testament to you all. And so I just really thank you all thank you. for your support. And, and you've been a big supporter since our days at the mosque as well. So yeah, thank, you. thank you. I say lost my shoes. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know that, Madam Chair? I think I'm the very first person in the history of that mosque where they lost my shoes. I'm sure you're not. <laughs> <laughs> yes, actually, I am sure you're not. <laughs> thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you, Council Flaherty. Council Clara, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and thank you to outgoing, ingoing, incoming Director um, Vali. Your tenure in this um, office is commendable, especially during the pandemic, right? When um, this, you know, the, our, our immigrant brothers and sisters were feeling this uh, more than anybody. So I just want to thank you for helping me when I was um, here in the council as a staffer um, and helping my community, especially East Boston. Um, Alex, it's so good to see you shining. Um, you're doing an excellent job. Um, and I love shouting out staffers where I can. And your uh, office in particular has some incredible people. I just want to name out Renato, Carol. On everybody, they're just amazing individuals who are doing incredible work on behalf of this city. So shout out to them. Um, I hope they're listening in, um, and just you know, representing a district that does include East Boston, but just in general, um, as an elected official now, I want to utilize every opportunity just to say publicly that it's a priority that we ensure a just and welcoming um, city for everybody, especially our immigrant and undocumented brothers and sisters, um, and you know, East Boston in particular as we all know, rich immigrant history where many people came to live out the American dream. Um, and East Boston's diversity and, and differences of cultures and perspectives, I think, is a strength. So cultivating that and keeping that vibrancy, um, that beautiful tapestry of individuals is incredibly important. And I know that your office um, really uh, focuses in on East Boston, and particularly in our Latinx community. So thank you for that. Um, I am grateful to all of my council colleagues for asking these questions because now I don't have anything to ask. Um, I, I do, I'm just kidding. But uh, my questions around the Greater Boston Immigrant Defense Fund were um, so poignantly asked by Councilor Jen. I echo the calls of Councilor Braden to do everything we can to lessen the wait list for ES, um, ESOL classes. I know that the wait list in East Boston is extremely long. Um, I'm curious to know why there is such a long wait list? So is there a lack of educators? Are, you know, how can we be helpful as city councilors to loosen the bottleneck on this? Because the, the need is so great. And so how do we build that pipeline for people who are, who are doing this work? Um, so I'll take that. I, and uh, I just have to congratulate you. Uh, and I understand this is your first hearing, Councilor Coletta. Second. Second, sorry, second hearing. <laughs> And uh, just delighted to, to be that. And with that, I also want to congratulate our Madam Chair for leading uh, this whole process. And uh, of course, our, our, the first time President Flynn as well. Um, uh, so on, on, the, on the ESL piece, the reason it is complicated, and I think there's more learning that, you know, personally I need to do on that issue as well, but we just have people coming in at various different levels of USOL. Mm -hmm. and. Um, that requires a different uh, teaching skill set, right? And so it's not one of those, it, it's not an easy problem to solve. And it's not just one that you throw resources at because we also need the appropriate human capital. So the appropriate teachers at the different levels to be able to teach. And, um, you know, it, it can be very costly because people are coming from very different backgrounds and have different needs, right? And so, I think there is a way to solve this pro pro problem, but it is a really complex problem because of that. Mm. And so, you know, um, ENB does amazing work, uh, but they just, because of the needs being so varied, uh, varied, and people have different interests with the ESL as well. Some want to just get a job, right? Um, others need, want to socially integrate. And, and so it just, th that's why this problem is a challenge. Um, but it, it's a challenge that certainly if I were staying in that position, I'd really want to think carefully through and um, you know, come back to this council with a real plan around. So. Thank you for that. Um, I want to shift to the Immigrants Lead Boston program. Um, Carol, again, incredible work on yes. this. Um, so I know that you said that this is really for folks to become leaders and advocates in their community by interacting with city hall officials. 
I have done a lot of thinking. I, well, I've spent a lot of time in civic associations. Yeah. Um, my, that was my job. I feel like I've gone to over 300, 400 at this moment in time. Um, I probably will go to more. No, I know I will go to more, actually. Um, and a large part of advocating for your community to City Hall is through these civic associations. Yeah. Like it's a very concentrated source of power. Yeah. So, you know, I'm trying to figure out um, how we can get these folks who are, who are in this program to, to attend these civic associations because I go there and it's a very homogenous group of people, mm. right? And we all know that the more that there is diversity of lived experiences, especially mm -hmm. the immigrant experience, the better we all are in making decisions. And the city does look to these civic associations um, for their input and opinions on development projects, right? And it, public safety. So is there, um, is there any intention to have these incredible folks who have gone through this program to start interacting with these civic associations and getting them to show up and maybe even becoming a leader um, in these established groups or even starting their own groups? Well, um, such a great and an important point uh, by you, Councillor. And you know, one thing I'll say is that the team's really open to feedback and continue to learn and shift um, the program around. So um, I will say that we, um, even during our uh, current cohort, we do really encourage people to get engaged. We have a pretty large definition of civic, uh, civic you know, ownership, if you will. Um, and while, of course, kind of our focus is how do we get them right into the city engaged there, um, you know, we, we, we do try to really um, to uh, support them in their growth, either in immigrant nonprofits, which also end up having a lot of power and, and push and pull in the city, um, or, or these civic associations. But I think because you've been to over 400 of them, um, and, and <laughs> um, you know, I, I, we would really welcome your idea and, yeah. and your contribution into, you know, how, how to shape that piece more. Yeah, I would be happy to help with anything. Just yeah. let me know. Uh, and I, I, I know you shouted out some of my staff, but I have to tell you, you have to meet all my staff. Because next time I'd love for you to shout eat every one of them because they're each and every one yeah, awesome. Yeah, absolutely. I look forward to meeting everybody. <laughs> These are just my, my core people. Yep. <laughs> um, the, Dreamers, the Dreamers Fellowship, uh, another incredible... Um, program I'm just looking through so because they're not um, able to apply through the success link what is the process to apply only because I do know that there are some wonderful um, young individuals in my community that would be perfect for this yep. and who does the processing um, and then also what is the major expense in the program that accounts for the 481,000 yep. um, so I uh, let me take that in steps. So first, uh, how do they apply? So um, uh, this is a program for a variety of reasons, which I'm happy to share, um, um, you know, just, just to spare everyone the minutia of it. But I, it, the way it works is it's a grant out program. OK, so uh, YE puts out an, um, uh, an, an RFA, um, and different providers um, you know, apply for it. Now. Um, that it does require one fiscal coordinator um, that then has a partnership with a, a number of immigrant partners. Okay. Um, last summer, we had, um, I want to say, um, a fiscal coordinator was Rion Immigration Center, and um, there were eight other immigrant partners from Centro Presente to the Caribbean uh, Youth Club. Um, to the Brazilian Workers Center, to uh, Binca, um, and uh, the application process again was open. Although, by the nature of the populations that these folks worked with, it, they kind of pooled into their existing, um, you know, kind of clientele. Um, that was 200 folks. Uh, now we're expanding to 480. It's a huge opportunity, and one of the things mm -hmm. that we are building into our uh, application process for whoever gets it is um, uh, is that they publicize this so that it's uh, accessible to exactly the, the young people uh, that you're talking about. Um, I, uh, this spring, we did a, another iteration of that, although we had to get private funding for it. Um, and 
uh, that was actually the, the fiscal coordinator was uh, and is right now is Caribbean Youth Club. Um, and so, and, but they're partnered with very similar organizations like Centro Presente, Binca, Brazilian Workers Center, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, so to your second question in terms of the funding piece of it. So the, the, the stipends that the young people get from this prog program um, comes from YEE, um, and that funding is covered. Uh, what our funding covers is really for the fiscal coordination and the, uh, and the program coordination of that, the evaluation of the program, so really ensuring that there's high quality for that. The feedback off of the previous years we've gotten is that um, this just, by the nature of how complex just making, uh, doing this program is because of some of the, um, uh, you know, we can't pay these youth, right? Um, and, but some of those kind of challenges and the coordination around the partners just requires a number of resources. Um, so that's what uh, that funding is going to go to. But um, uh, you know, it, it, it's going to get to 480 young people, and it's a, it's a sizable investment. I don't know of a city that's doing mm -hmm. um, uh, that across uh, the country. And um, you know, talk about equity. I mean, that's a real clear example of what we're doing on equity. So. Yeah. Um, I would just recommend working with the local high schools. Yes. Too. I don't know if you already do that. So Binka is, is a key, key uh, one. East Boston High School has also Boston. inquired yeah. about the program. You know, some of the schools have capacity to actually run the program there. Um, so Binka has that capacity, some don't. But we've actually prioritized in the spring how to make sure BPS students are the ones that really get um, you know, enrolled in this. And that's, that's a big part of, with these 480 uh, folks, we really want to target the BPS children. So. Awesome. Yeah. Um, and I will just use the remainder of my time to shout out, um, talking about mental health supports. And I was lucky enough to sit down with Patricia Montes from Central Presente, who is doing great work. I don't know if you're already partnering with her on this, but that yes. would be the first place to look. Uh, yeah, I know that uh, Patricia does a number of um, um, uh, just uh, honestly a number of uh, important programs. And uh, by the way, when it comes to legal services, uh, I mean they were one of the uh, programs that we uh, organizations we've piloted with um, on this. And also the Dreamers is another program that they um, have been a really key uh, on this. So yeah, couldn't agree with you more. And and uh, have so much to learn from Patricia, so. as we all do. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Council Coletta. Um, Alex, your budget, um, or at least proposed budget for uh, 23, FY23 is only um, 466. You took, there's, a, there's been an increase, and I'm wondering, um, a decrease, yeah. rather. Um, and I'm wondering, so why is that, and are you able to uh, meet capacity with this budget, with this new proposal? Um, so the budget, it, it's the decreases through because the program is transferring to the new child care office, um, and that puts, um, and that chunk of the budget includes our child care entrepreneur fund funds, and it also includes um, our child care survey funds as well. So that's why we see sort of that disproportionate decrease in the budget. Um, when it comes to our own programming, um, this is going to be such an exciting year for MOA, and we're really looking forward to to creating new programming and to creating new initiatives. So now let's just say um, it'll be a great time for, for us to keep engaging and see how that can help us draft and, and gain new, whether if it's new opportunities through programming or new partnerships with the community, but definitely looking forward how this budget can help us. Thank you. Um, Council Lujan asked you a question about um, salary or at least um, equity, wage equity bet between women and men employed in the city of Boston. Um, you mentioned you could look that, you could look that up. So, um, so just to clarify, through the report that the um, Women's Workforce Council does, those, the information that the employers do um, give the Women's Workforce Council is given confidentially. 
Um, so we are able to look at an overall arching, but when it comes to our own salary, um, our, we have the amazing tool of the diversity da dashboard. What in that dashboard will be, we'll, we're able to see um, those numbers based on the information that's currently uploaded on the diversity dashboard that the city, the city currently um, hosts. Do you have those numbers ready? Right in front of me right now, I don't have the numbers ready for you, but I can go back to the dashboard and look at those numbers and happy to send an email and send it over. I'd like you to submit um, what is the gap between women and men in the city of Boston. And then, um, then if, there, if you could break that down, the demographics of those women by race and submit them. Thank you. City of Boston employees? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and that's across all departments, if you don't mind. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and then as far as salary negotiation workshops, we, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a good thing to have um, interventive sort of programs to teach women or to support us in uh, something that is needed, right? Um, not, that, not that we don't know how to do that, but that it's a conversation that needs to be had and I'm happy that you'll pro you provide that platform. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder though, then, if we are talking about a workshop to get there, mm -hmm. then there is a wrong here. And I, I, I have looked at the different numbers like sporadically between different departments, and it's pretty bad. And if that's the case, then how do we right the wrong? Right. Yeah, I mean, it's a longer ended question. I um, mean, the salary negotiation classes are, are helping and are sort of helping. This is why we're reshaping them in a way where we are able to help close those gaps, in a way where we are able to help those who are maybe um, marginalized, specifically, like I mentioned earlier, when it comes to those who are not salary workers and who are not, who currently don't have the opportunity um, to just say that they currently have a salary and they were focused on that and focus within different areas of, of the workforce. Um, and I'm hoping that the new way that we do the salary negotiations are help us get there, specifically around the pack that we are gonna be offering them in different languages, which is definitely a huge step into the right direction um, and is also helping us reshape and re-see how we're able to support different populations of women and those who identify as is in the city. I guess um, what, what I want to understand is your point of view in terms of where lies the issue. Is it that we don't know how to negotiate or is it that the, sister, the system systemically is discriminatory toward women? Right. I mean, I think it's a, it brings up a lot of questions, right? And there, it starts with employers and how can we engage employers in ensuring that they're helping us close that gender wage gap. Um, and this is where a lot of the conversations that we are having with these employers through the Women's Workforce Councils are very important. As to what are, I always answer, and this is one of the things that I bring up, especially to your point, what are employers doing to helping us close the gender wage gap? Because that's when we think about where it starts, right? When we go and apply for a job, we think about how much is offering for salary. Um, our employees are 100% being transparent with that, and this is where these type of conversations with these compact signers, like we call them, are very, very important to have them and answer these questions and help us raise these questions, and they're allowing us to get there. As women, and specifically, I'm speaking to myself as a woman of color, when I first started to work, I never even thought about the fact that I was able to negotiate my salary. Nevertheless, to think that I was able to push back and ask, can I have more, right? Um, and that's just something that as, as we come and we come as an, as an experience, opportunity like this are help, us, help us break those barriers. But going back is a beginning of a conversation through, through employers. How many people are in your department? As of right now, um, full-time department, we have our communications um, director, we have our program manager who focuses on our childcare work, we have our office manager, and we currently are hosting the Economic Mobility Lab Fellow, um, and we are currently hiring and sort of extending an offer to a policy manager. Um, but as you can see in our budget, um, our policy, our sorry, our program manager role for the child care is also transferring over into the child care, into the early childhood education office. Well, is it safe to say that your capacity is only four? Yes. And then, I mean, with a budget of only $466,000, we're talking about equity and closing the gap, the gender equity gap. So 
How is $466,000 equitable for a budget with all women? And this is what's going to help us um, shape that budget coming up. And I'm hoping to take this time as a time of research and as a time of digging deep into having those conversations with the community members and obviously with the help of all of you from the council. As to I'm saying you don't get paid enough. So um, no need for us to go around that. You, Alex, don't get paid enough. And you're leading the work to close the gap. And um, let us know how we can help you advocate, whether through a workshop or this council, to get you paid more. Um, if we respect you, we pay you, right? And you're doing the work, we should lead by example. Um, thank you so much for everything that you're doing and your beautiful presentation. Um, although it took some um, work for me to uh, keep up with your fast talking. <laughs> um, Brother Yusufi, uh, your th thank you for being here and your amazing work. Um, the one of the interesting thing that I saw in your top um, salary earners, though, is that it does not include anyone that is black. Um, and I guess you know I get with of course with turnovers and issue or challenges hiring people. Um, and I, I understand this is already a pre-existing issue in this, the entire city, um, but what, what can we do about that? Yeah, so f first of all, on that data, um, there's someone that identifies both as Hispanic and black, um, but they're counted as Hispanic in that data. Um, the other thing I'll just say is that we, since my time being there, we've actually brought on two black staff, and as you know, how the the pay scale works is, you know, we, we, we come in at different grades and steps, and I think given enough time, so some of the other folks have been on the staff for longer, but given enough time, they would actually climb up, um, you know, to there. Uh, but I, I think it's a great point, and I think we can always do more work. I mean, race is the central challenge, um, I think, of America and, and, and Boston, and so um, certainly I think, you know, th there's always more work to be done there. Thank you. According to uh, your strategic plan 2021 to 2023, you aim to counter devise national rhetoric and policies through proactive communications, advocacy, and legal tools. Can you tell us um, how you have gone about doing this? Yeah, so um, as you can imagine, uh, Councillor, this was really important uh, during the Trump years. Uh, but actually, under the Biden administration, we've found ourselves doing that as well. And so a great example of that is you may be f familiar of the public charge ruling uh, that actually the previous president, um, you know, had tried to, to change. And this was essentially that, um, um, that, that some, you know, that, uh, uh, that, and I'm trying to think about how best to kind of define this, but uh, essentially our immigration system doesn't allow people that are deemed a public charge, just those who are, who would be basically um, become someone that's dependent on the U.S. government, um, the ability to get status, right? And so, what the Trump administration did was added a lot more criteria to to deem a person a public charge, right? Now, the good news is the Biden administration was, is trying to roll that back. And so um, there's a whole comment period that's required. And so we as a city, working with the BPDA Research uh, Center, submitted a full report to the federal government um, suggesting why this is such a bad, bad rule and why we need to um, go to a far more progressive understanding uh, of public charge. So that's an example. Another example is, um, when we saw the Haitian arrivals coming here in the border uh, over the summer, uh, they were coming here with just uh, irregular permits, with terrible, pa you know, irregular paperwork. 
that we just haven't seen, um, you know, in previous, uh, previous, I mean, we did see that in the Trump years, but uh, not before that. And so we uh, use the mayor's, uh, Mayor Wu's, uh, you know, um, a power and, and relationships as a city of Boston to really begin to push the Department of Homeland Security to see how we can get some regular paperwork and, and uh, really kudos to Unlay on my team to, to lead that work. So those are a couple examples of how we do that. And other times it is just simply putting out uh, a statement when there's a policy that's enacted. Um, um, and we did that again a, a lot during the Trump years, right? Uh, uh, whether it was the use of ICE to go after communities, thankfully not in Boston, but outside when you know Trump would threaten raids we would uh, then uh, make sure that the mayor is out there, you know, assuring our residents that the city is going to protect them. That's why we passed the Trust Act here um, in Boston. So those are the kinds of things that that we have been doing, and we'll continue to do it as as you know, if that kind of hate results from the federal government. Thank you. Um, what what's the budget uh, plan or? strategic plan for this, or what is the budget for this strategic plan? Uh, you, you know, we, we actually feel like we've got resources already built into our budget to be able to lead this new strategic planning process. And basically, I think the most important thing about the strategic planning process is we're going to be doing uh, focus groups um, uh, with our immigrant or, or, uh, uh, communities, and we've already done two, three of them that have been so, so enlightening. Uh, one actually with the Latino community, by the way, in East Boston. Um, but what we're really trying to do is center their voices in our strategic plan. And so we want to do them with different uh, communities. Um, and, um, um, and, and so, but we have the resources already to do that, to be able to, uh, through the LCA budget, pay for any of the language needs. Um, we're able to, you know, even pay some of the organizations that, um, that are supporting us on these uh, uh, focus groups, uh, give them a small grant for that, which is also beneficial, by the way, for their own uh, strategy. Um, so, but, but we feel really confident that we have the money for it. Okay. And so far, I think each of the focus groups would cost around $2,000. Okay, thank you. Uh, can you describe a little bit more about the 12-week civic program? Yeah, so it's um, um, every year close, uh, around 20 residents, immigrant residents, um, go through this program. Uh, they learn about how the city works, how the budget works. They get to meet with different directors and chiefs, and so we have different chiefs come in and, and you know, talk about the programs. And then often we encourage them to set up a meeting uh, with, with that chief. Um, so it's really closing that equitable access gap uh, piece. Uh, by the way, uh, uh, Councilor Coletta, my phone was blowing up because we do have a se session on civic associations that I w ha was not remembering, but um, my, my staff reminded me of. Um, and, um, uh, and you know, th there was a BU study uh, on it actually when we first did the pilot um, that just found um, uh, just it to be a really successful program, I think, if I'm not mistaken. And we can get you this, uh, this report actually, but 90% of the folks we're really engaged um, post the program. So we've got 38 participants so far from 25 different countries represented, and um, I'm happy to go through those countries if useful. Um, no, this, this, that's great. That was my next question, who you've reached, but um, that's great. I, I'll, I'll yield my time. I have more questions, but um, Councilor Coletta, uh, please go ahead. Thank you so yeah. much. And I, um, I could not um, attend this hearing without um, asking questions of you, Alex. Um, the women's advancement is something that I've worked on, you know, my entire career, either electing women or just building a pipeline of leadership. So this work is incredibly important to me and just know you have a partner in me um, in this work. And I actually, when coming out of college when I graduated in 2016 um, from, from UMass Boston, I took a pay equity uh, workshop. And I was offered a job for $35,000. We all know that that is nothing in this day and age. Mm -hmm. And um, I negotiated a $10,000 increase directly Amazing. because of the work that um, this program um, does and, and what I learned. So um, I am a, a case study, if you ever need one, <laughs> um, and a testimonial. But, and I am pleased to hear that uh, the classes are working to be more inclusive of low-income workers. 
um, and informing them of their rights. I would also throw domestic workers in there as well too. They're largely unseen and underpaid, um, but they are the, the folks who keep working women in their positions. So I would um, shout them out and recognize them. And when you're thinking about next steps in reshaping the office, um, pay equity and closing the gap is important. I think it also speaks to what we can do to build and maintain wealth. So, and that includes financial literacy. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, how to create a budget, understanding how credit works, saving for retirement, mm -hmm. understanding financial instruments like bonds, stocks, and creating an investment plan. Mm -hmm. So that could be the next step. I already know women in this area that are doing this work. So you could hire, you know, small businesses who are, um, or even just contractors or consultants who are in this space. I can think of one who is a Spark alumni who is doing this work. Um, so that's just something to consider as you move forward when you're thinking about, because the childcare work is moving, right. how to advance um, this work moving forward. Thank you so much, and it's so great to see you, yeah. Um, and we're, we're, we're really excited, and I definitely, your, your support's definitely appreciated. Looking forward to chatting more how we can do that work. Awesome, that's it, that's all I have. Thank you, Council Coletta. Um, Alex, I, you know, th so there's, there's different levels of the work that needs to be done for women advancement, but we are not a monolith, right? We are different shapes and sizes mm -hmm. and colors and um, personalities and culture. Um, so I wonder, what, is there any initiative in your department that you guys are developing to um, address the different cultures and identity for uh, the women, and there are women of different influences as well, right? Um, and so, what what are have you done, or what are you doing to to address those needs? Yeah, we um, like I mentioned earlier, we we started doing some research in regards to that space, and specifically, we have done some work um, in regard to other um, nonprofit organizations. We're really looking forward to um, the opening and the the new executive director for the Office of LGBTQ Advancement that's going to allow us to also tap into that work as well and also tap into um, working with that population as well. Um, this, I'm looking forward to be able to to create that pipeline and create those programs. As of right now, we currently have not done any program around there, but I'm definitely looking forward to um, getting into that work and research throughout this year. Thank you. Any. Any work around camaraderie, any, anything in terms of community, um, in terms of um, collaboration and healing, truth and reconciliation in our community? Definitely. Um, a lot of the work that we do is it's fundamental based on, on community feedback and community support. Um, and none of it would be possible if it wasn't for all the feedback that, that, that we receive for all of our, program, for all of our programming. Um, we do offer spaces and currently offer that space within the child care sector. And this is why we're definitely looking to expand that um, moving forward. Um, this is something that especially that we need more, especially when it comes to thinking about as women mental health and how we prepare in ourselves for, for that moving forward. and, and our lives in general. Thank you. Well, um, thank you for the work that did you want to? I just Sorry. wanted to correct one statement I said, uh, uh, Councillor, which is uh, uh, it's $1,500 per focus group. That's the grant, not $2,000. So just wanted to be right for the record. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> thank you uh, for that. Um, I, think, I think that's phenomenal, obviously. Um, speaking from personal experience, um, I know that you know this. Um, I spent 17 years in the U.S. without uh, any documentation, and um, I just recently became a citizen in 2019. And so, <laughs> understanding um, that immigrant experience, um, I really have a deep appreciation for civic engagement. Um, I, of course, believe in your work and um, really think that you're doing a phenomenal job. Both uh, absolutely love your team. Um, I love that it's all women. I wonder um, <laughs> if men want to come into the, your department, but um, they have uh, applied. <laughs> yeah, right. I look forward to um, collaborating and working with you. Um, again, I, I meant that you um, yourself needed to get paid more, and I will uh, look forward to your new position and working with you as well. Thank you so much and. Um, if there's and no other statements. Uh, Madam Chair, just thank you for your leadership and 
um, it is really historic that we do have the council that we do and mm -hmm. that we have folks like you with your background yeah. and experience, um, you know, leading the council. And, um, and we have got a mayor that's got a similar background, and I think, um, for women, for immigrants, mm -hmm. for uh, really those that have not had a place in City Hall, mm -hmm. uh, I think, you know, this mayor and, and yourself and City Council is um, just in a historic moment. And I just want to say, I think, on behalf also of my colleague, it's um, uh, just really a privilege and an honor mm -hmm. to address this council. And I know I'm going to be telling my daughter about this. And uh, certainly, hopefully, if I have a privilege to have grandkids, about the fact that we're in this historic moment. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. It's definitely, when, when we look at representation, when we look at how that shapes and form throughout City Hall, um, it's definitely something to be proud of, something to be engaged of that uh, we are able to serve and be able to be surrounded by so many amazing and so many great people like yourself. So thank you so much for having us. Thank you both for your kind words. I hope to live up to any of that. Um, <laughs> I look forward to working with you. I appreciate you. Meeting adjourned. Thank you.